Thank you for joining Change I Am Possible, which is India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Yuri Gogatsi, Distinguished University Professor and Trustee Chair of Material Science and Engineering at Drexel University. He also serves as Director of the AJ Drexel Nanotechnology Institute. Professor Yuri has co-authored two books written more than 550 papers in peer-reviewed journals, including more than 30 papers in Nature, Family Journals and Science. Thank you. It's a complete pleasure and honor to have you on the show. Really appreciate you taking time and being part of a humble podcast. For my audience who don't really know what nanotechnology is, can we start over there and make our audience understand what nanotechnology is? Um, sure. First, Eddie, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to speak uh, and uh, be able to deliver some ideas of nanotech and nanomaterials uh, to your audience. What does it mean, nanotechnology? It means working with extremely small objects. So um, let's actu- let me actually go back uh, to ancient time, to Stone Age. People used to take a piece of stone and carve something out of this piece of stone a tool, a knife, something big and making something smaller needed shape out of it. And even in our current era, Silicon Age, where all the devices, say computer you're using, cell phone I'm using right now have silicon chips inside, materials derive from sand. And then they carve out uh, complex shapes on it here and they add other materials here. And when we start adding, atom by atom, nanotechnology starts. We are pushing to a next uh, level, where we take few atom-sized particles, sheets which are as thin as one atom or two, three, five atoms, and start building out of it. So instead of taking a big chunk of material, carving something out, we take nanoparticles. Nano means one billionth of a meter of that size something like a hundred thousand times thinner than a human hair and we use it as building blocks as a lego blocks compare uh if you play a lego or just uh bricks if you build a house and we built out of this invisible atomically thin small bricks so this is what nanotechnology about changing things we make and build devices materials everything we need in our world right right so you mentioned that what you're dealing with is extremely small objects would it be right to uh, say that the entire universe is made out of atoms and, and when they clunk together they form or, or, or come alive into animate and mm-hmm. inanimate mm-hmm. objects what is the difference between atoms and, and uh, nanotech mm-hmm. or, 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 or the nano? What, what would be the size or scale different? You mentioned one or two mm-hmm. atoms it makes up a nano. Would you like mm-hmm. to elaborate more on, on, on that? Well, uh, first, what you mentioned correctly, the entire universe, at least nature, already uses nanotechnologies. Now, what is the difference between atoms and nanoparticles? We cannot take a single atom and operate it. We need to fix on something. We need to have assembly when atoms become stable. And in conventional world, it's a bulk material, like a piece of steel or piece of silicon. And material has certain properties. We know, for example, steel is sufficiently strong and say rubber is uh, stretchable because it consists of many atoms arranged in certain way. And this arrangement gives material properties. Now, what I did not tell you in the beginning, nano means not only small, it means different properties. If you take a piece of, say, graphite, we use it uh, to uh, write uh, like a black trace make on paper, Uh, artists use it. Uh, Everyone uses graphite in pencil leads uh, to write on paper. And it's a soft material, which easily separates in pieces. But if you take a single monolayer of graphite, graphene, it is very, very strong, like the strongest thinnest of foil 
you can uh, make here. So what it means that we need to have certain arrangements of atoms to be able to build, to use it as building blocks. But when they arrange in the nanoscale in two-dimensional so-known sheets, when they're like a one or a few atoms thin, or like a virus, like DNA or nanotube, they have different properties from the bulk. And this is why by building this from nanoparticles, nanolayers, we cannot only make materials, say, or device without uh, losing, removing anything. But we can make also devices that have different properties. Right. So, so you mentioned that when atoms clunk together, they they create, like like you mentioned, rubber and, and whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and with nanotech, you need nanomaterials to kind of, you know, and uh, create things. So how, how, what what are the materials, nanomaterials available at this point in time? Graphene is, is one such material. You have yeah. discovered mm -hmm. Maxine. Mm -hmm. would, would you like to talk a little bit about the that and how, to, how does it work? How does it all come together? What does it take for it to clump together and create something like that? Uh, let me uh, first uh, kind of uh, use an example to explain why it's important that atoms clung together in certain way. Uh, most people know that graphite and diamond are built of the same atoms. Those are carbon atoms, very, very common environment. We're actually also built mainly of carbon humans because organic materials, molecules contain, first of all, carbon. However, properties of graphite and diamond are very different as everyone knows. Diamond is transparent, extremely hard, Graphite is black, soft, uh, leaves a trace on paper. So what it means is, it means how we clung the atom, how we bond the atom, as we uh, say in chemistry, to each other. Properties can be different. Now, what we are trying to do in technology, to again bond atoms within our thin layers and structures in the way they give us required properties. There are many nanomaterials, hundreds that can be made in substantial quantities. And let me give you an example of something that you may not think as a nanomaterial, but which it is, clay. Clay consists of two-dimensional sheets. What it means is that few atoms seen layers. So if you take uh, just regular clay and put on the microscope, you will see tiny, tiny layers. And of course, uh, when you, uh, for example, uh, make a roof for the house or pottery out of clay, you don't think of it as non-technology. But if you take particles of clay, separate them, put in a polymer, it becomes nanomaterials because now separated particles of clay have different properties. So you see, nanotechnology is not something very exotic. You can use a conventional material and it's already used in large quantities. And let me give you a few more examples that uh, our listeners uh, might have heard about. There are very interesting molecules of the same carbon shaped as soccer balls. They are called fullerenes. Each of them has 60 carbon atoms in exactly like if you take a soccer ball, you will get the shape of this molecule. But relation between a fullerene sphere and the soccer ball is the same in size as between soccer ball and the planet Earth. So you hope you can understand how small uh, it is. And this actually discovery of fullerene to a large extent was the beginning of the non-technology era. Because people realized that they can not only take like a something existing like DNA or clay particle, but actually build design from atoms nanoscale, very small structures, which say have fuller in 60 atoms. Graphene can have many atoms, but again, it's a one atom six structure. So you see, we take one element, only one atom, carbon, and we can make diamond bulk and graphite. And we can make soccer ball shaped molecules. And we can make uh, tubes, which can actually move like a water molecule one by one. What we can use like a tiny, tiny conducting wires, the smallest possible wires, or we can make them in a sheet which is called uh, graphene. So those all materials. You see how you write now. Now, 
to make, say, cell for a computer, we need lots of different materials. We need materials which conduct electricity, we call them conductors. We need materials which prevent short circuit, we call them dielectric. And we need materials which can, for example, pass electrons one direction or another direction, uh, which only pass electrons if you apply potential, we call them semiconductors. So we need, again, for electronic device, we need all those different materials. And we cannot necessarily build them just out of one type of atoms. Imagine all the world, all the building built of uh, exactly the same uh, gray bricks. It would be horrible, right? Yeah. So again, we need different building blocks. Same with nanomaterials. We need large numbers. So what scientists learn how to do? How can we make different atoms align in the same way, but bring different properties. And here come maxines. Here. So what is unusual about maxines is that we can have almost unlimited number of composition. We can take a dozen of metal atoms like titanium, molybdenum, vanadium, tungsten, many different metals. And we can take carbon and nitrogen and align them layer by layer in a structure like that. Three layers, five layers, seven layers. And depending how we order them, how many layers are in the structure, they will all have different properties. So what we can do now, we can finally tune properties. Just like we can also color, for example, is one of those properties. We can make them blue or green or orange or violet or have golden color so and it means it have different optical properties we can make them highly conducting like good metal and make them semiconductor to build electronic devices so what it means it's kind of widening the range giving us all the building blocks we need to make devices of the future but also improve devices used today right you mentioned that there are more than 100 nanomaterials that we know of today at this point in time and you also mentioned that maxines you know is one of those nanomaterial which can create unlimited compositions you know you can bond differently so mm -hmm. would you say that Maxine is one of the best nanomaterial at this point in time with unlimited applications or are there other also uh, uh, nanomaterials out there? It's always difficult to claim what is the best. There is probably no best material. There are most widely used materials. We need materials with specific properties. How we look into material science and nanotechnology of the future that we use a computer to predict properties. For example, to make this type of a device, we need material with this property. We need extreme strength intention that never breaks. We need it to conduct electricity very well. We need it to be a safe on our skin. We need it to be able to sense certain biomolecules in uh, uh, sweat. And we predict, we built it experimentally and say we make smart clothes that will be strong, that will be stretchable, comfortable, and that will be able, for example, by analyzing sweat continuously, doing the analysis, sending information to a cell phone or a computer, monitor our health, something like this. Now, why we talk a lot about graphene, maxine, nowadays clay but less about fullerenes say because those materials we call two-dimensional material they are like a sheets of paper like in the books behind them. they all have 2d shapes imagine if you were packing behind you objects that are spherical that are tubular that are flat like books you will never be able to fill all the shelves uh, so well and so densely. And this is exactly what 2D materials, graphene was the first example. There are many other similar like boron nitride, molydisulfide, which is also used as a solid lubricant. 
vaccines are for. They are to be. So we can align, basically pack these layers in any sequence we need. We can have first number of metallic layers, conductors. Then we can have material which will, for example, store energy. Then we can have a dielectric separator, another layer of material store energy, another conducting layer. What we get, we get a better. So we can basically pack them and it all will be dense. It will be all be nicely packed and strong and so on here. That's why attention of many scientists now is attracted to so known two dimensional materials. It means that materials which are extremely thin, every layer, every sheet has exactly the same composition and properties, but they are large in lateral dimension. So we can again build them like a bricks in the wall or uh, pack them as Lego bricks, but build something. Like you take Lego and they stick to each other and you have a car or you have a plane or you have a, uh, a toy figure or something else. Here. That's exactly what we are doing with our materials, but for practical applications. Right, right. So, w would you like to simplify this to my audience? As in, you know, when, when, when you're talking about these nano uh, particles, nanomaterials, what is the technology you use to view the, the, these nano particles? How do you manipulate and bond these things together? How does, how, do you, how does one go about it? Well, that's a very good question because we cannot see them. I mentioned that these particles are like a 10 to 100,000 times thinner than a human hair. So it means if I have a single particle, you won't be able to see. However, we have instruments which we call, they're called electron microscopes, where people make a beam of electrons that go through particles and visualize it because electrons are small and they can basically show us even very, very small objects, even single atoms. And we know their size, therefore, we know their thickness, we can measure them. And once we have done it here, we deal not with single particles, we deal with many particles. And again, let me go back to clay. Uh, how people make pottery. They don't take like a single clay sheet, which again, nanometer thin, uh, invisible part. They put clay in water, mix it, make a slurry, and then uh, uh, basically use the slurry to build a pot or a plate or something else. We do it a kind of a similar way. We put particles in solution and let them so known self-assemble. For example, particle negatively charged will be attracted to some positively charged particle and solution. And they come together and they assemble. Or we can take number of different solutions and we can dip our object, for example, like a telephone screen into one solution, another solution, one solution, another solution, or a lens of a glasses that you're wearing and one solution will, for example, have be able to filter certain wavelengths of light and will correct vision for colorblind people because they will provide proper light correct. And certain layer may be photosensitive and change its color, its color uh, when uh, sun shines a lot of UV and uh, make your glasses darken. And you can put another layer, which is actually allow you with a push of a button uh, or maybe just uh, on your cell phone, uh, pushing a button or not on a frame, change the color at will. That even if sun shines, you can basically make it lighter or you can make uh, your uh, uh, glasses uh, darken even if you uh, drive in a car and uh, windshield uh, prevents UV from uh, going through. So those are kind of, for example, like a smart glasses. This is an example. And you let every layer just simply absorb on the surface. And there are even very simple ways of doing it. Many people use, for example, spray coating, spraying gun to paint walls or something else. If you take very dilute solution of nanoparticles inside, you can just spray them on any surface and they will basically stick making like a monolayers or few layers on the surface. So you see, you don't need like a 
expensive technology, million dollar technologies to build. Because anything we want to make real, we need to have a simple manufacturing process. Right. We just need to understand what is inside, how things are done. And then we can use uh, simple, you can go to uh, a hardware store, buy a spray gun instead of uh, painting walls in your house uh, in uh, green color, you can produce a uh, nanomaterial coating. Right. It, it, through the course of the conversation, you mentioned that these nanoparticles have the property where they can self-assemble. Maybe talk a little bit more about that and your current research at, uh, at the Draxel mm -hmm. uh, Nanotechnology Institute. A bit more than 10 years ago, uh, we discovered a new family of materials, which we called maxines. What is this? It's a carbide and nitride. So it's a composition for carbon atoms, and metal atoms or nitrogen atom and metal atoms are layered, forming new structures. First, we discovered one of them, the titanium and carbon, two very common elements, appear to be great material, strong, highly conducting, has many, many useful properties. And then we started to discover more and more and more, and by similar principle, building a large family of materials. We are trying to tackle problems which are important for people, for humanity, using this material. And one of them is energy storage. We are trying to make better batteries because these materials conduct electrons very well, but they also conduct ions within the layers, so we can build better batteries. Another application is communication. We can make very, very thin printable antennas for communication, making smaller devices for internet of things. Another application is in water desalination. I already mentioned here, if you take a membrane and have layers which allow certain ions go through and some ions can't, or allow water molecules go through, but won't allow ions or impurity molecules, organic molecules to go through. We will be able to purify water, take contaminated river water or brackish water and, or salt water from the sea and make drinkable water. But there are many, many other applications. Let me tell you application I'm considering very important. We're exploring it now with a company called Nefria Bio. It's a Using these materials, again, somewhat similar to clay as adsorbents. Maxines can absorb urea. And there are millions and millions of people in the world suffering from kidney disease, who depend in their daily life on dialysis. But dialysis machines are very, very good. So in the US, people who have uh, uh, renal uh, failure, late stage kidney disease, have to go a couple of times to uh, laboratories where they spend several hours each time being connected to the dialysis machine, cleaning their blood from uh, products uh, of activities of our bodies. So what we are trying to make and build a wearable kidney. And again, for this, we need material that can very efficiently remove urea and other molecules. So if we can solve this problem, we will make life of many, many people much better quality of life, but also save lives of many people who suffer from this disease. And it's actually appeared to be uh, a specific particular problem nowadays after uh, COVID because many patients in hospitals which have severe COVID cases and stay for a long time uh, on uh, uh, oxygen uh, support respirators, they have significant damage, kidney damage. And at the time, for example, uh, when the first wave of COVID uh, came to New York uh, in spring 2019, uh, New York hospitals were running out of dialysis machine because they got many more patients as a result of uh, COVID. And this shows you how important it is to develop new materials. 
If we have new materials that can do something that current material can't, we can save lives. Many of them may be life-saving, like this wearable kidney technology I mentioned to you, or improving quality of life potentially of millions of people, uh, like uh, uh, desalination and purification of uh, water and providing drinking water. Here. So we're trying to tackle those type of technologies, which are important, which can make a difference uh, uh, for uh, lots of people. And that's pretty much uh, the goal of activities we have right now in my research group. Lovely. We wish you and the team the very best. You mentioned <laughs> that nanotechnology has got so many different applications, you know, right from smart clothes to energy storage, communication, water desalination, desalination. And you are specially vested in the wearable kidney that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? I, is this market ready? How big I, is the unit? You know, when you mentioned it's a wearable kidney, and and how does it work? I mean, and and are there more such offerings uh, where you you've tied up with other industries uh, that should be coming soon? Well, again, first, there are always multiple offerings and multiple opportunities. Even as we try to use Maxine, there are some other uh, companies that are working on developing other technological solutions. Um, so in a technology, there is always competition between different solutions. And some of them work, some don't. Some of them become uh, more efficient, some other less expensive. And at the end of the day, market often decides what becomes practically useful. As scientists, we cannot enforce the uh, use of any material. But what we can do, we can make those materials available to engineers, to companies. So I think this is uh, how uh, technological development uh, goes. And then if we are successful as scientists and engineers take it to the next level to devices, then everyone else in the world benefits uh, becoming users of this technology. Exactly. What are you most excited of nanotechnology and where do you see this technology going in, in, in the near futures? What are the, the crazy ideas of nanotechnology you see coming to life in the near future? Well, uh, you might have heard about quantum computing uh, and again, having some kind of a computer that can be small enough to be embedded in our clothes and flexible and working at room temperature, doing all this computation much faster would definitely change the world. Smart clothes. I think this is the way the world is going. We will wear uh, all the same, you know, people reading news on the sleeve of your shirt and instead of going to a doctor office uh, you pretty much will use smart chip or uh which is sticker coming from and analyzing say sweat uh, saliva breath and pretty much provide information about uh, your uh, health and actually again probably preventing uh many diseases because instead of just going once a year to a doctor uh, for a health check then disease can be caught immediately when it just started much earlier stages. And let me mention one more thing here. These big industries, like big steel industry, big coal industry, others, they are industries that largely pollute the environment, the spend all the energy. So my hope is also by using materials in the way they assemble from existing materials. We will also develop technologies which will be much more environmentally friendly. And also, I hope we'll minimize side effects, environmental damage, and other threats. Because again, if you have invisible small particles, you really need to know how they behave, whether they may be toxic, how they propagate in the body, in the environment here. So there are always concerns like with any new technology here. But that's why, uh, as scientists, uh, we need to work hard to understand those materials and provide, hopefully, safe and useful solutions for future technologies. 
Right. Yeah, I, I think the future looks so exciting. And I think this is the first time in human history, I believe that, you know, technology has enabled us to correct the wrongs and, and create businesses where instead, you know, what, what we have done so far is we have created businesses and that those those when we solve a problem, it ends up creating an, another problem. You know, so it, it's not a circular, in, mm -hmm. a, 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 you know, a, a, economy or second circular building whatsoever you know so so i hope that you know we we take care of the planet and if we create a, a, a solution we see that the solution works in the long run rather than creating a, a, another problem you know there are these futurists such as ray kurzweil and others who've been saying that eventually we'll get into a point where we'll be able to manipulate matter atom by atom and they're saying that we might in mm -hmm. fact, in the near future, build a nano assembler, uh, a nano 3D mm -hmm. printer where we could, you know, yeah, yeah uh, you know, so what are your thoughts on that? Is that something which is possible, feasible? <clears throat> it is all right. It's actually already feasible. There are already ways to manipulate atoms. You can uh, build atomically thin layers by many different deposition techniques, like atomic layer deposition, for example, there is a technique which is have really this atoms name in it here. You can drag single atoms by a tip of uh, say, scanning tunnel in microscope to position. However, what is also important, if we can only move a few atoms and we have to do it forcefully with manipulators, we can build small device. We can build maybe a computer chip, which is by itself extremely important, but it's not the way you would build, say, artificial kidney, wearable kidney, or water desalination membrane. We still need much larger thing. So I think we always try to push to the limit. Yes, we can manipulate single atoms. Now, how can we create hundreds of metric tons of certain material with certain properties by doing it here? It can only be done by simultaneously kind of a chemical synthesis, chemical assembly processes, things here. So I think we learn single atom manipulation techniques, but we also make it them scalable and they're producible. And I'm sure it is going to happen at industrial scale uh, because we have already ways of doing it here, but there is also, keep in mind, there's always pretty long way from initial discovery to practical limitation till every person can benefit from uh, those technologies. Things. But it's coming. What's your dream? What What is it that you want to be known as? Where would you see yourself in the next uh, few decades? Well, again, it's uh, difficult to plan, especially in my age, uh, for a few decades. But one thing I certainly want to see is Maxine's two-dimensional carbides nitrides to be used, solving practically important problems. Again, whether it will be shielding our electronics from electromagnetic waves, this is one of the applications we use, protecting people from electromagnetic noise around, including this Havana syndrome being discussed now in press in the US. At least. To Internet of Things enabling tiny devices communication to treating uh, uh, renal disease, uh, kidney disease, or uh, providing smart clothes to people here, but being useful, being something that I can say, look, it was not in vain. We produce technology, we produce materials that had a positive effect on someone's life. And I think this is when the uh, dream really comes through when things like this uh, happen. And I will continue working on developing, improving these materials, developing less expensive, more environmentally friendly synthesis method, learning how to produce materials with even better properties that engineers can use them and put them into devices, applications, and make uh, life of people uh, better. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, keep, please keep on doing what are you doing because yes, we need engineers, professors such as yourself who are laying the foundation of what the future is, is going to look like. So thank you. Really appreciate you taking time for me and being part of the podcast. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. Really appreciate this. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Thanks to everyone.